we'll let you take things out. Yes, thank so, you. You can send me a recording got too. <laughs> got it. Yeah, I got your it. Finger, Great. So we're very excited to meet you and talk to you. We all saw your movie um, in the last week and um, I, I suspect have quite a few questions and comments. Um, and I think your brother, CJ, is gonna do a more formal introduction of you. Is that correct, CJ? Sure, I, I, if, if that is uh, yeah. still up, I, I, I wanna be very brief because I know we wanna make yeah. sure that we have the chance to, to talk with Martha and, and ask her questions. And I hope that other people from Becky will have that. So so I'll just go launch into this. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my, I'm CJ, many of you, you know me, but I'm really happy to introduce several members of my family uh, most notably tonight, coming into us from Hollywood, California, are my sister, Martha Coolidge, mm -hmm. and her husband and co-collaborator, Jim. Who's right here. Spencer. Well, hi. Jim. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll, first of all, we'll so, yes. so Martha is, is my sister, uh, but because she is the oldest and I'm the youngest, growing up, I did not see a lot of her because she was already out and she was making <laughs> movies all around the world uh, when I was still quite young. Uh, if I remember correctly, she went to RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. She also did film work in New York. Uh, she did some early documentaries as well as television work. And I got to be in one of the television shows that she was a producer for. Um, and uh, But I'm still guessing that probably in Martha Coolidge history, the big break in terms of recognition by Hollywood itself would have been Valley Girl, which was a movie that came out in 1983. And it featured amongst its cast members a very young Nicolas Cage. Um, Martha has gone on to earn numerous Emmy nominations, as well as an array of awards from a big variety of cinematic organizations. Martha, I think even more notably, has served or did serve as the first female president of the Directors Guild of America. And I think wow. that's an amazing achievement. And she could talk to that if people have questions on that issue, because women and Hollywood didn't always mix very well. Um, with her is Jim Spencer, is, who is my brother-in-law. And he and Martha met through their film industry work. Jim has done art direction and production design work for countless movies and shows. He sent me, I forced him to send me a list and uh, you know I, I could have printed off several books in order to cover all that. <laughs> but one of the things that I think many people may know of is that he worked on Lost, the TV show, uh, at least for one season, provided some of that really kind of funky interior design work set design that you might appreciate if you watched Lost. Jim has also won an Emmy for his work as an art designer. Now, I could go on with a lot more information on both of these folks, um, it, but I think we'd all much rather engage with them in conversation about today's topic, which is their new film, I'll Find You. Now, many of us watched this film together last week in person, and I must say that I have seen it twice now, and I found that viewing it in a dark room with a gathered crowd and on a large screen much superior than watching it on my little laptop as I did the first time at home with people going in and out and the dog barking. It just, it just that horribly alters the, the, the theatrical experience. So it's a theatrical, it's a visual feast to see this movie. And I hope that you get a chance to see it on as big a screen as possible. And it will suck you in in the best possible way if you let it. So let's ask a couple initial questions, Shoshana, you and I, and then let's turn it over to other people. And I would just love to have uh, Jim and Martha just go off on a point that you think is very interesting and that we would enjoy hearing about. Um, so let's see what questions come for. Shoshana, what, what have you got to say? Or Martha and Jim, do you want to just give us a little bit of an introduction about the film, how you got to be involved with it, um, and what was it like to make this film a hit, big historical pageant in some way? in comparison to some of your other work? Well, I think probably we'll get to that e easily, automatically. And maybe <laughs> we should start with you because it'll come, it'll come up, believe me. And if it doesn't, I'll bring it up. <laughs> okay. Right, Jim? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. Excellent. Well, okay. you got involved with this. You got a call from somebody in Poland. It's better if you just talk. No, but give, give them the... Well, okay, I got a call from a producer I'd worked with years before, Fred Roos, who works with uh, Francis Coppola. 
And he said, I want you to read this script. So he sent it over and he said, just be, be tolerant, just it's long and please just read it. So I read it. It was way too long to be a feature, but it was great. And I had a lot of concerts in it and lots of things, all kinds of characters. But it was in Poland during World War II. And I, I just was fascinated by the idea of making a movie in Poland during, you know, set during World War II. I just thought that was an incredible opportunity. So I talked to him and then we kept talking. We talked to the people who initiated it. And then I had to make a proposal. So by then I'd really put my idea together. I pieced it out of the elements that were in the script, but it was only a small part of that. And, uh, and then within a month or two, I was hired and we were going forward because he felt he had to get the film shooting by July, which is, I knew was a ridiculous idea. Well, but, why are you? And uh, why me? Yeah. Why me? Why did he call you? He called me because Fred told him to call me because I had worked with Fred on a film for yeah. Francis Coppola, which I never got to make. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's a, a long story. This story may come up, but actually it turns out he'd never seen any of my movies when he hired Fred? me. So. <laughs> not no Fred had, but not oh, the okay. producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was the financier, an independent individual who's Polish, who paid for the whole movie. Who wrote the, I think, the original idea for the script. And uh, it, was, it was based loosely on his father's uh, life in that time. Well, that, Actually, that, that, that his father amazing. and his grandfather. Wow. wow. You know, that, that's, it's an amazing thing to, to hear about. I was curious where the story came from. And I, I saw somewhere in the, in the script that it was uh, based in the credits, it was based on a story. But I was glad to hear about the financing of it, because I think, Martha, you shared with me, anytime you're doing a, a historical piece, the production costs just go way up, because you don't just go down to the corner lot and, and rent a car from, you know, cheapcars.com. You had amazing pageantry there, horse-drawn buggies and metros oh. and trams. Um, well, it, it is. It was an extraordinary experience going to Poland, which has enormous still uh, damage done to it by the war. But it it also is a place where it is accessible to certain things that were around then that you simply can't really access in other countries. And uh, so it was, and we'll talk about it, but it, that was an amazing experience. And when I first went there, they dragged me around. We went for days to museums and old houses and this and that. It was great. I mean, just amazing what they have. But then of course, when you just go to old houses, there is no furniture. I mean, that, that one of the things that was so interesting was how hard it is to put together a production when there's no real center of the movie business where you can rent everything. Most European, uh, you know, English and French and Italian movies that go to Poland uh, come with their heads of departments who get the, the costumes and things from their countries. Well, that, that was a question I had as a, a history major. Do you, when you say, gosh, what's going to be accurate in terms of costume, in terms of set design, in terms of what's on a street way, by talking to historians or are there people in the film well, industry who specialize in historical drama? You, you hire costume designer and the costume designer had better be historically knowledgeable, which she was, she was amazing. But also in these countries, it's very filled with reenactors. And the reenactors, I wouldn't trust them as being the most accurate about uh, you know, uniforms, but they certainly knew more than I did. <laughs> I, they, I have to say, uh, gr growing up as a kid, I was always grumbling at Hollywood for getting this stuff wrong. Like when, my favorite one is the movie Patton, where yeah. Patton confronts, confronts uh, 
Rommel in the desert and you see the German forces advance, you go, why are they driving Vietnam era American M60 tanks? <laughs> that's not, you know, that's totally wrong historically. And, and I have to say everything I saw in this movie looked correct to me. The, equip, the, equip, the M3 half track, the British uh, standard carrier, you know, uh, the uniforms and everything. Uh, that's the military stuff. And then I, you know, I assume much of the uh, civilian stuff was, you know, fabulous. The, the BMW that, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. Yes. Well, well the, the, the uh, uh, first aid dude who came in for the second shoot, because yeah. it took two years, two parts of two years to shoot it. Mm. He caught us on the tabs that were on the, uh, I can't even say it anymore. It's been that long since I've made it, but uh, the German um, Secret Service guy that yes, Stellan yeah, goes to see, but he, he's wearing the wrong color tab to match his stripes. But oh, that's wow. the only thing I've found out. So yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring something up that might not come up in conversation that you have told me about before, but uh, it, it's it, the, the idea in Hollywood of Westerns where you can tell the good guys and the bad guys by who has the white hat and the black hat. Yeah. And, and you've talked to me once about your choice of uh, the set decoration for Robert's family. And being the daughter of a modern architect that you, you uh, had something <laughs> in that design. <laughs> well, I, I said... The, it, it was starting to look like the whole movie was taking place a thousand years earlier because mm. of, you know, what we were picking. So I, I definitely wanted to work in the new architecture because Poland was very engaged in that. And they even have names on the, the styles for different cities that they have. So it was, and there were a lot of those buildings. And I, I love that we actually got in one because... Yeah they they are very occupied yeah, yeah. <laughs> also also and uh to answer your question about um all the, the carriages and the old cars and all that kind of stuff when hollywood comes to town no matter where we go <laughs> the cornucopia of goodies that you know that we need for our period <laughs> or whatever it is yeah. Just veil themselves. I mean, it's it's, right. it's quite wonderful. But it, it wasn't so easy in Poland. <laughs> we even got a couple costumes from the United States, but um, we went to uh, London mostly for various women's things and uniforms and um, Paris also. Uh, I mean, it's amazing where they end up going because I wouldn't even know about it if I hadn't tried to call one of them and they, oh, she's so and so, you know. So. Well, you hire you hire the department heads that have been down the road. Before. Yep. Yeah. So they know yeah. where, where all the bodies are buried, and they they call their friends in England and blah blah blah. So <laughs> and here it shows up. Well, yeah. let's hear from you. I'd love to. Yes, please. Yeah. What what questions, Sushana? Other folks. Uh, what did what comes to your mind as a question or a, an observation from watching the movie? Well, I'll start. I was I found the music just incredible. It's almost like another character in the movie. Yes. So so nuanced and different music for different settings and um, and amplifying the story. And I just wondered how you chose the music that you worked with, or what you know how that process worked for you. Boy, I, I would like someone to write a book and tell me how I did it. No. <laughs> what, what happened is before me, there was another director. In mm. fact, several. There were a couple of Polish people involved briefly. And then there was another American director. And uh, he loves music. So he was really involved. And that's mm. when we found out about the... Uh, a certain rigidity in our financier who they, uh, the guy worked like hell on this for months and then presented a list of the pieces he wanted to hear played, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, anyway, he quit, he quit. And when he found out that he wasn't really gonna get the choice of the music he wanted, but you see by this time, they now picked some of it and so I had been listening to it and I'm very familiar with classical music. And, you know, so I 
I, I really liked it, but I, I did keep music that was appropriate for the scenes and the story and this and that, added some other things, uh, uh, took, took off on a couple of things that were mentioned to me by uh, some of the people around. Um, uh, and then uh, had we got children's orchestras to play the, the children say, I mean, how many different places recorded music for us? It, is a, it was recorded in London, in um, Warsaw, in um, obviously in Woodge, in uh, and the United States. I mean, it was we recorded the stuff everywhere, and it turned out that Leo, who came on rather late, Leo Suter, the lead, is a singer. He's from a family; they're all singers. They're actors and singers. So he sang a lot of what he sang all the time and he could do tenor, yeah, he but he couldn't really do opera tenor correctly. So we got a great opera tenor who sang for him, but with him. And then we blend them together sort of. Oh, nice. That was really interesting. And then Stellan doesn't sing at all. And that was his first, I don't sing period. I won't be singing. And of course that's a joke, but, uh, he 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 really studied and he he loved the guy who was the tenor and uh you learn things every day the guy who was a tenor he was an international tenor etc and um but he had been most of his career a soprano i didn't know there were men singing soprano all around i didn't know that so maybe you know that maybe you don't know that but anyway he had just sort of he just decided to put himself into the slot of tenor. And so that was great. And we just learned stuff every day. And uh, when we played, sometimes because we recorded in all these places, we had designated one violin to be her violin. But when that woman wasn't available since she was in London, then I had to go re-record violin later in the movie. Mm -hmm. And piecing together music like this is crazy, but it is amazing what they can do, what music editors can do and the sound editors can do and how they can really make voices fit into, I mean, if they're really, if we all work on the lip syncing and everything, it's amazing what they can do. So. It was, it, that was a kind of a great experience. Okay, what was the biggest boogle with music? I'll tell you. <laughs> we shoot and we don't have an editor because the producer had not allocated enough money to pay an American editor, a real good editor. So I couldn't get an editor and I knew who I wanted. I mean, I had several people, but so it's already now December and we've been shooting since September, October. So we finally get an editor. He goes in, he works, gets his room together. We're basically finishing shooting that year. And he calls me to tell me all the music is out of sync. And nothing is worse to hear. Just let me tell you that music is out of sync, all of it all of it, everything pre-recorded, which is recorded to, I don't even know, I then spent the next year trying to figure out why, because we had to go back and record more music and uh, shoot more. So the editor, the assistant editors figured out a formula of how many frames the, 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 the thing had to be slowed down in order for, to, to catch up and anyway, it's all in sync now, but not one ounce of that track is originally in sync, which is amazing. Wow. There's yeah. A, it's a <laughs> wow. Oh. Uh, Jim, if I may ask, I remember, and I didn't catch it second time I walked through, but the first time I watched it, I remember seeing uh, your name under one of the production units and that you were heading one of the production units. Now, was that in a particular geographic locale or a particular set of scenes? Actually, we moved his credit and it's really up near the front. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
then perhaps my question doesn't make any sense at this point. Well, no, it makes sense. It does. Okay. <laughs> it, and by the way, these, these credits are, they're sort of a mess, but that's okay. At least everybody's got their name up there. It, it, everybody and their uncle has their name up there. So uh, <laughs> it's like people who I never heard of and never met are on the credit. So who knows? But it's great because, you know, we weren't paying a lot. And so it's good. But Jim was actually there a lot. And the only official thing he did with pay was second unit director. Yeah. Well, I came over to visit Martha. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, can you work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, luckily, luckily, I'm a director also. Yes. So I'm a member yep. of the DGA, so it's illegal for me to. And, uh -huh. and he asked me if I would do one day of second unit, which is picking up pieces of things that the first unit couldn't film. You know, run by with cars and, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, shot of uh, Benno going going to Auschwitz, you know, on the road, ah. motorcycle. Like Motorcycles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, that was, that was a, a really fun shot. Yeah, that's a great shot. That, <laughs> but by the way, of the music, I mean, a lot of it's old <clears throat> classical music, but there's original score too. I remember you having to go over. Oh, no, to... there's original score and that's a whole other, but let's not get into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What are the those? questions? Is what are the questions from the peanut gallery here? <laughs> Anybody else? I think somebody else had a hand up. Uh, oh, peanut gallery, go ahead, ask anything you want. Yeah, that's good. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah. Did you go see that? Oh, yeah. yeah, you're muted. I'm mute, Betty. Mm -hmm. So, first there you go. of all, thank you so much. I have to tell you that we love the movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, thank you. I thought it was fascinating. I really, um, we watched it in a dark room with just three other people, <laughs> but it was, um, it was quite amazing. And I wondered, I understand the story itself is not true, right? It's not based on actual. Yes, it's based, it but is. see, it's based on so many people. Yeah. I heard so many of these stories and I'm not saying millions. I, I just mean that I've met quite a few people who have one ver version of the story or another. And I cannot tell you how many people I met uh, who lived in the walls. Wow. People would live in walls and live up in rafters. Well, in, in woods, they lived in, yeah. in, the, in the zone and, we shot in, yep. we resurrected it. When we built Auschwitz, uh, not Auschwitz, the, when we built Woods the Ghetto, People were coming out of their apartments and saying, I remember when it was just like this. Wow. Which is a chilling thing to hear if you're American. Because it's still a mess. You know? right. mm. Well, and you don't know what that feels like. It's, it's incredible. I mean, I've read a lot about that, but it, with, with all the death and all the horror, to have a beautiful story come out is, you know, is mm. very nice. But I also wondered, um, how accurate some of the details were, like the orchestra at Auschwitz and, yes. and the way they were treated. Um, I mean, obviously the uh, commandant or whoever it was, is that true? I mean, is that based on, on fact? Is it- Yes, and it's not just based on him, almost many, many of those commandants had orchestras. Uh, and those orchestra, uh, even more than uh, Auschwitz had more than one orchestra, really? and the, those I instrumentalists were playing all the time, hmm. private concerts, just a few, and then they'd have bit, little orchestras, big orchestras. They played for the arriving prisoners. Uh, uh, they played for the people going into the gas chambers. I mean, it's just it's it's so amazing and horrific that uh, and and. It's understandable. Now, I never met a person who felt the way she, the character, feels because they were alive today. They're alive because, or were alive yeah. because they played. That's why they lived through it. Mm -hmm. Now, 
uh, in this case, she doesn't want to play again because of what it reminds her of having played for and losing her family. But uh, I'm sure it happened because I found that it didn't really matter what story anybody told. I always heard another one that was sort of the same. And um, it really amazing. So yes, it was true. And they were treated better in the sense of that they were given maybe a little better food but they were still used as sex, you know, uh, people, they were used, uh, they weren't treated like- uh, Human beings. Me. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't. Yeah. Thank you. It was amazing, I think. Mm. So. It, it, the whole thing, and then there were other funny little things like we had, we decided to burn down Bergen Belson because they did because it had a cholera right. thing oh. and so we decided okay well they had flamethrowers okay let's not you know I mean it's really scary to bring up things like flames and you don't have a, a professional Hollywood effects crew but you know these people worked on a lot of movies and so we had the art department built us the flamethrower so they took a sort of pieces of uh, tank and they put it together and they created this flamethrower. Now, earlier in the movie, we had shot the escape from Woods. Mm -hmm. And the, that's when I met the stuntman. And the stuntman thought it was really funny to stand behind me and shoot his gun. <laughs> With no warning, you know, nothing in film is done like that. You do it, you know, with, okay, we're going to have a, uh, you have safety meetings. Oh, yeah. You meet about it forever. But he just shot it off right, right behind my head. And I just wow. lost my temper right there. I fired him. I said, I never want to see him again, get him off the set. So, yeah, why, why did he think that was a good idea? Well, there's a good question, but I wasn't going to hang around and find out. He no, just thought it was funny. Just for kicks, you know, not, yeah. not, not pertaining to any No, no, it was fun. Hmm. And I'm telling you, it, it, it's, anyway, that, that, there is a bit of a guy thing there. But anyway, <laughs> what happened is they drove out the flamethrower. And as they drove out this flamethrower, I said, that guy looks familiar. Who is that guy? Uh, we had him good. on this movie before? Well, it turned out it was that guy. Oh and I said, you're kidding. What is he doing? Now, the art department hadn't known that I fired him on the spot, you know, so they'd hired him and they said, oh, he's great. And he built this. So we get him out there and we say, let's have a, just a rehearsal, no flames, just a rehearsal. So we, we do all the calls, you know, the ADs calling, you know, he shoots the flamethrower off early, burns totally sets on fire the set. Oh, was, <laughs> I mean, that was really a disaster. Was a, anyway, oh he, he didn't last long on that. But uh, it, it just suddenly funny things like that happen because these people all know each other, you know, so they're all hiring each other and they're, they have that over you. You don't know everybody. Wondering about that thing. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> It was fun though. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it, was, it was fun. It was 30 degrees and it was really and cold. Mud, mud. Oh. Oh, and snowing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine you you don't get a take two once you've burned it down. I well no, it, it was it was built to be able to have take two. Yeah. So oh. we had to repaint it. We had to paint it and all that, but it it, it didn't burn down, thank yeah. God. <sighs> Isaiah, you had a question. Well, I, I was wondering, I mean, it's, you know, it's a horrible situation to be filming about. And nonetheless, you made an incredibly positive and romantic story out of it. And that's it almost seemed incredible given the topic. So, I, you know, it struck well, me. Me, I'm like you. I, when I thought of it, I thought, oh my God, love story during, and, and then I kept thinking, it's perfect. No, people don't do that. It's, but of course, I, and I kept saying to people afterwards, you know, we are all of us survivors. 
not just of this, but every war. We're the survivors. We're the with we're the we're the product of the survivors. The progeny. And so understanding this what it is to survive, it because you have to pull it together. You have to go live a life. You have to mm -hmm. raise children and have a future and all of that. And I, I, I realized that's who the movie is for, you know? So that's who I'm making this movie for. And of course people fall in love in the middle of war. You do. And often that's what keeps you going. Right. So, so the people who were positive survive. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's, it to me was really, and also as an American, we were all asking, didn't they get away? Come on, somebody had to get away. And then you gradually hear the stories, how people got away, but it wasn't like a whole place gets away, but you know, uh, the, the guy who was the spy who, was, who went and got himself admitted into uh, Auschwitz with three other guys. And then they were sending uh, photos out and the photos made it to the, all the presidents of the countries and everything. And then they, actually got out they made friends with another guy who was working on the cars and they got the uniforms i don't know how and they put on the uniforms of the commandant and they drove out <laughs> you should make another movie about that well they've done that but oh, you know. the great escape <laughs> yeah escape. i mean it's incredible they they drove the great out escape that's right wow. <laughs> so you know but that wasn't the only and then uh, one guy told me his grandfather was in there and he he was picked there was a guard who would pick one person give him a shovel and they'd disappear and then the person didn't come back so they all thought that the person was buried so it turned out from his grandfather the guy took him out made him dig a grave and then he just gave him an orange and let him go that's what he was doing and he let these people go one at a time. Wow. wow. It's weird and amazing oh. how many people like that. Yeah. A weird question I have based on the one little bit of post-production I saw, Martha, I was visiting you, I guess, a couple of years ago. And before I went off to the airport, you brought me downtown to where you were in a dark room with some post-production sound editors. And it was the scene in the ghetto, or at least one of the scenes in the ghetto, when there's some police walking by. And yes. then you had you had to have a discussion with them about, wait a minute, are these pole, are these just Poles? Are they Polish Jews working for the Nazis or are they Nazis? And it went back and forth because you had to figure out what would they be saying? Would they be talking in Yiddish? Would be they talking in Polish or would they be talking in German? And, and I remember I realized, wow, there's so many. So many of these little details oh. you get, you know, and but I think it also showed those were they are Jewish, those guys. So in, in, to me, that's an interesting complication that you don't think you always think, OK, there's bad Nazis and then there's, you know, victimized exactly. Jews. Yeah. And then you have in between them these Jews who were basically serving as a police force for the Nazis, maybe with good intent, maybe. To well, actually, their they're skin. serving. I don't know. They're serving the the Jews because the Jews would rather have them than have Nazis. I see. Yeah. So they were, uh, you know, strict keeping everything strictly run, and they got more food and all that stuff. And uh, they're the guys who were chasing the two guys in the when they're escaping, uh, Leo and the other guy. And when the Nazi guards shoot them, and uh, it. It, it's interesting because it was layers, layers like that of, of security. All the little details that had to go into this. And yeah. It was amazing. Um, what else? I have to admit, also, I'm glad that you touched upon this. I mean, again, when we watched this at Becky, I just sat there with everybody and we really dutifully did what probably no audiences do. We watched all the credits. We went through all the credits and able to oh, see God. the whole thing. And no, but it was fascinating when you know somebody who's involved in it, a couple of people like you guys, you start to be curious, okay, what goes into this? And then when I got to the end, I was amazed to see that Leo Sutter was given credit for so many of those songs. And I said, 
you sang. He really sang that. Oh my gosh. What a, what a, what a bonus to have somebody like that who can act and can sing. Well, it, it was amazing what talents people had. The boy who plays the pianist <laughs> is a concert pianist. He, he goes around and gives concerts. And the, uh, you know, the little girl, Natalie, she gives concerts all the time. She can play the piano, play the violin like crazy. Wow. Uh, so you, you do keep uncovering people and their gifts. And then if they don't have any training, you know, maybe they haven't known long enough. To, I mean, Leo, the, I mean, the boy who played Leo as a young man learned how to play the violin just to do those scenes. Wow. He did. And That's he played impressive. it. Pardon me? That's pretty impressive. That's pretty huh? impressive. It's really impressive. That's dedicated. Man. I mean, people are amazing. What If you can hire a person who knows what they're doing, uh, I learned this on another movie I made, and I hired the Northridge Little League team because they'd just gone to the World Cup, and it was amazing. I would give them a circumstance like your pitcher. You're pitching, and there's two outs, and you, you know, but you you can't let them get another run, and blah 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 blah. It was amazing the emotional quality mm. of how real it was to him because he plays baseball very seriously. Mm. And it was, it was just amazing what people can do. And I remember we were in Czechoslovakia making a movie and I had to have a nurse shaking a thermometer and it was incredible. We could not find anyone who could shake a thermometer <laughs> <laughs> properly. Anyone and under the age of 50 probably. No, anyone. anyone? <laughs> and, and they couldn't do it. They just never done it. I don't know. I, I, it was amazing. And, uh, you know, it's just a funny thing that you rely on, but then you realize, oh, yeah, none of the thermometers are made with mercury anymore. They, they don't have those. And this was set in a period. So it was, you know, you live and you learn. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're curious, anything else, I'm, I, I've, I just could not believe all the things I learned. Another thing that we learned is people starved to death every day in the ghettos. Oh. Amazing. Yeah. Just lack of food. And then, and they didn't have any place to, they would put the bodies in the street. That's what they had mm. to do, which is already, that's depressing. Um, I, I do remember um, from reading that Anne Frank died in Bergen-Belsen and she died of illness. And I have never seen a Holocaust um, portrayal, either documentary or whatever, of, of the, in the detail that you showed in the movie about what was happening in Bergen-Belsen with people dying of illness. You know, the sign said typhus. Was it yes. typhus or cholera or both? They had typhus. They had other yeah. things too. It was horrible. Yeah. And the water was all, it was horrible, mm. really. And, and, uh, and overloaded. I mean, those, their, their little houses were built, you know, they'd build a house for a hundred people and it would have a thousand people. So it's just, you hear these numbers and you just can't oh. believe it. It's amazing. Mm. And by the time the English got there, basically most of the Germans had left. And it was just all these victims and, and the commandant and a few other people to keep it straight. And that was it. It was really horrible. Mm. I, I, um, thinking about the overlap between your film coming out with a significant period of history, World War II and the Holocaust, but we're now experiencing something that we don't quite know yet, how right. horrible we're going to be seeing the news coming out from Ukraine, yeah. you know, as uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of Ukrainians are being held hostage and we don't know what's gonna be done with them. We don't know how deep a genocidal motive Putin or his troops have. And it just, it, it stirs my blood to think that, oh, we're probably, we're just as we're discussing this from World War II, 
this may be replaying itself now in a different flavor with different bad guys and different good guys, but it's just horrible. Well, but we see that from history, it repeats itself. Yeah. And that I think that often we're too kind toward uh, uh, people who may be at fault, but it is a human thing to kind of give in to certain, I mean, it's awfully hard to stand against machines like that. And then now we know that, you know, Hitler had these people, all of the soldiers were all on amphetamines and it, oh. it just, the whole thing is so, such a nightmare. Hmm. I think it's very bizarre. I mean, just sort of bizarre comma that uh, the pandemic delayed the release of this movie for two, we're waiting yes. for two years for it to finally get released. They go, fi finally, you got a date. It gets released almost to the day that Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, yeah. it's like, I think it's, it's one day funny. different. It's really funny. <laughs> Not funny. Not, Not funny, funny, just bizarre karma. It's just well, <laughs> it just shows you that no matter what, people have a danger of repeating. It's easy. Mm. These things are human weaknesses and uh that's why it's such hard work mm. and it it is hard work and uh it's it and it and i of course have so much curiosity about how people survive and why they chose one path and not another path and and yet i don't know if there are really any clear answers some people it, it was the right thing to do and that's what they did. And mm -hmm. then other people just felt it was better to get along and, you know, mm -hmm. make things not a huge fight. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it is incredible what, what must have been the, the, the dual lives that people must have lived. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you face up to that really, uh, but, um, they mm. certainly did. Anyway, it was, and, and the other thing is how many, and I, I will say it exists, how many heroes there were, how many people were working in the underground, yeah. how many people were just getting people out as fast as they could. Mm. I heard incredible stories from Denmark, uh, too, because um, there was an incredible thing happening in Denmark, you know, all these people have boats and they would at night slip in their boats and take people away wow. and get yeah. them free. It was really incredible. The whole, the whole thing is, is, I, I can't even imagine because as Americans, we don't know, we're not fighting on our land, but mm. it, it got, it has got to kind of unify people in a certain way, certain people. I, what I, I see hearing the value of this film as well as the uh, inspiring aspects of this film, and it makes me really want to see that, sure, I'd love to see this now out more public in public cinemas and theaters, but I also think this is a hugely important and potentially uh, valuable piece of education, not only for Jewish community groups the way that you're talking to us tonight, uh, film festivals, obviously, and there's a lot of Jewish film festivals, but just history. I mean, just because now I think a lot of times people in high schools have gotten, oh, they teach this subject and they teach this subject. Showing your film would be enthralling because the quality is Hollywood level quality. It's not just I'm putting together some movie about the Holocaust, blah, 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 blah. It, it is a full feature length film with all the stops pulled out from making it a cinema film. And yet at the same time, you paid attention to detail and you're gonna be giving a really important history lesson at the same time. Mm. I think that this is gonna have a lot of legacy and a lot of legs way beyond, you know, anything that happens with, uh, you know, just the general release. And I, well, I hope that you guys consider that because I think there could be a well, lot yeah. of places that want well, this film. You know, it isn't up to us. This is a business. Mm. And it's, it's a business where those who stand behind the initial distributor who do it later, uh, the, often I don't even, I don't even know who they are. I never mm. speak to them. I don't know anything about them. And it uh, certainly isn't up to me, but 
I do think that exists. And I do know that people are paying attention like that. And I've been teaching at college level and graduate school level for 10 years. And there's so much interest in the subject, like you're saying, very much interest and very different values, very different values expressed by young people today of what they think is uh, wrong and right. And there's a lot of resentment against um, my generation for leaving the world in such a mess. And yeah. it's quite a discovery to realize. I mean, I'm not surprised, but uh, mm. it's real. Mm. I, 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 well, the, the fact that this story came out as we were watching Ukraine, you know, made me think, oh, of, yeah. what, uh, you would think it would get talked about more. And one of the things that sort of surprised me here, you. Uh, release a new movie and it's like almost no, no talk nobody like Stellan Skarsgård or anything didn't go on you know uh uh the Daily Show or anything like that you know we, 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 you would well, think at least fresh well, air would want to talk to you about this movie or something I you know what did, did yeah, there, that, is that a racket this whole world of of no uh, no no it's like that though but yeah. they well there's no horsepower behind this movie yeah, the producer was such a uh, maniac that he turned a lot of things down. And we were looking for a distributor for years. Yeah, and he, he uh, got, a, got a deal for himself. Therefore, it, uh, we're, we're very fortunate that it came out and got to the play that it did. Well, there's also the fact that there is no way that any company, much less our producer, who would want to have in the initial release, still in Skarsgård going somewhere and talking about the, you know, Ukraine. But on the other hand, I think we all see what is recognizable in these movies and what is really worth looking at and talking about. And after all, there are still people alive who lived this and uh you know polanski being one but you know there are oops you got muted martha the, somehow you get your mute button got pushed down martha if you can uh we can't hear you martha hit that button again or somebody muted you perhaps still can't hear you martha it was my error. I needed to mute somebody else. Martha, so sorry. Hi. There we go. Can sure. you hear me? Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. So the the truth is, these businesses do not want uh, 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 an educational message or even a moral message attached to movies because they feel it's going to diminish their audience. I don't agree with that. I I think some of the greatest movies ever made you just you can't look at it that way but um so i think that it's going to be there but there's no way that that publicity people unite with educational people and talk about it it's just that isn't the way they do it but luckily this distributor does see they really have invested in Jewish audiences. They've invested in a different way to distribute an education, uh, not educate, a, a uh, independent film. And uh, because the budget was, um, it was a man who made a film with a lot of filmmakers. Luckily, everybody involved in the film knew how to make a film. We didn't have a lot of answers in the producing department, but everybody else knew. And uh, so we managed to make this movie for way less than anybody could that is one of these big companies. And that was great because we realized it really benefits all of us because there's less uh, pressure on the, the little company to make so much money back. That's, that's all, what they all think about is how can I get my money back? And that's really, you know, kind of beside the point. 
Well, people are in it for different reasons, it seems. <clears throat> yes, but don't feel bad about having to pay for entry. <laughs> it does happen. Yeah, that's good. And the the by the way, the art director was Polish, just like my cameraman. Both had been born and raised in Poland, and then left before they became professional. Uh, the art director had been a theater designer. And then, the, but the cameraman went to Denmark and finished his education there. And both of them really live in the United States now. But it was amazing because they were both Polish and they knew people there and they had connections. And it was really great. It opened a lot of doors for us. How long was the initial shooting period? You said you had to go back and do some reshooting. Well, it wasn't reshooting. It was that we never finished shooting. Uh, we started shooting uh, something like October 2nd or in September, maybe a couple of days. And then when you move cities, the way they do it is you move a city and you move to the new city. Now you don't have a big crew there that's been prepping. So you shut down production and then you spend a bunch of days doing another prep. So your, your, your crew goes on scouts and does this stuff. So it's like a on off, on off kind of thing going around Poland in different cities. Mm. And in a way it's a much nicer way to make a movie although a lot of time goes by. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why Jim stayed because he could really help he worked on his own second unit and he worked with the uh, production designer uh, just because it was such a huge department that uh, they needed all the help they could get. And um, we really, uh, so we ended up two days before Christmas or one day before Christmas, we just shut down. And I said, I'll stay and we'll finish after, but uh, they didn't wanna hear about that. So we, we had a few more days to shoot prepped it for months and ended up in a July and August finishing shooting mm -hmm. in Poland. Mm -hmm. Wow. I know it was a long time. I'm exhausted just hearing about it. It was exhausting. I've never <laughs> quite worked on a movie that long. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, two years in editing. I mean, it was, it was long. Yeah. But I must say that the food was delicious. The people were delightful. Yes. Cozy <laughs> and alert and alive. And Great people. Yeah. Uh, Marjorie, do you? Yeah. Have Hi, Martha. I just wanted to know what your um, experience in the beginning of, of directing was. And if you're happy the way um, more women have come into the director's chair. Uh, well, I must say it's extraordinary because it's all happened while I was in the sort of uh, coma of making this movie. And, uh, but it really has finally happened that there are more women being hired. They're not in the primo primo positions, but they will be. And, uh, and it is going on and things are changing. And it, because when I first started teaching, I'd get classes that were all men and it, you know, in the co-ed school. Uh, but now I even actually got one that was more women than men. That was amazing. Wow. So it, it's partly because so much publicity got out that there's nowhere for women to go mm. and to get a job that I think it, it made people afraid to go into the, that part of the business because they were afraid they wouldn't work. Yeah. Thank you. And that's a sad thing because women can approach things all different ways. I mean, it, 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 directors are about their point of view and yeah. their point of view is affected by their gender. It's affected by where they're from, what their experience has been and everything they know. I mean, so no two directors have the same attitude. And are the producers that are giving you the money to make these movies sort of responsible for that? Um, the producers available? are always, let's face it, they love film. 
a lot of them do, but they also want to make money. And so they're running a business, so they need a profit. They need to prove they can get a profit and they, they just aren't going to get financed if they can't at least stand up for that. So yeah, if, you're, you're getting a movie like Top Gun now that costs a bazillion dollars to make, you're, you're, unless it has an opening like they yeah. did. Um, oh, absolutely. Ooh. And then if you put four big stars in your movie, right. imagine how much money you have to bring in to pay back the cost of that movie. And that is what the, this, the, the comp, it, this has all been done, you know, making a, a sort of a Hollywood stream all over the world. But the problem is it, it then becomes incredibly expensive to make a movie. That's it. When you see the, what the friends did in getting money for, um, for each of their cast members to to get the same equity, and then you see some of these other actors making billions, hundreds of millions of dollars for a movie, and it doesn't get passed along to the other um, participants. No, it doesn't because, truthfully, the audience is paying to see that person, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't care who the other people are now. Right. There are producers who will say, I don't care who the other people are, but that's rare. Most people do care who the other people are, but they don't want them to cost too much. Right. Okay. Mm. It's insane. But in the end, it's sort of how it, it's the way that part of capitalism works. And uh, you could want to change it all, but then I would say you're trying, you're going, that's like two giant loads to carry <laughs> a inventive filmmaker and a social revolutionary oh my god <laughs> i know i know that you've you've always been a director from you know high school era's cheshire stage you know with ronnie oh god, yes. uh -huh. but um you see commonly uh well Halle Berry, for example, someone becomes, someone in Hollywood has some other pathway, they become an A-list actress. And then they say, now that I'm in a position of power, I want to direct and they get to be a director. I mean, it, it, it's sort of, sort of like, it seems terrible if that's the only way for women to become directors is they have to have- Well, it looked like it, but let's face it, I was directing features before they were. So yeah. I say, you if you have- a famous name that people pay to go see, that is going to help you get the movie made. And that's mm. why a lot of these big stars became directors. If they're talented, you know, they could, I mean, Robert Redford certainly mm -hmm. showed a great interest in material. Um, and there are other people who've shown that there really are a director, but they're, you know, and the people who don't see much in it probably don't do it all that much. It's a very hard job. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have yeah. another project that you're working on that you could? I do. I do. Is it a secret? Uh, well, it isn't that it's a secret. I the problem is it's so hard to talk about film like that and say what I want to do next is this because it might be 20 years before you make it and it might be never. So. I do. I have a, a couple of sci-fi films. I love sci-fi. Wow. I have a couple of sci-fi films that I love. I love science and, you know, I love all that stuff. So I have that. And Jim and I have worked on stuff together mm -hmm. you know, to try and get it done. And um, and comedy. I'm ready for comedy. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you know, but uh, the truth is, is you never know you somebody calls and you read a script and you're just like this i would it wasn't great it just really had something in it that was speaking to me and then i went to david ward and he ended up writing the script and he he'd never written a script like this before he wrote the sting and he wrote a lot of things but it was great it was so exciting to read his pages they were always revelatory <laughs> Well, and you got incredible performances out of the- Oh, and they were so great. Oh, God. And I love that. And you have people like Leo, who yeah. was 
a total, I mean, he'd gone to drama school and he'd sung and done plays, but he was a beginner. And uh, young people, some of whom were very experienced and some of whom were beginners. But, uh, and then a lot of European stars, and you don't know them as well because we don't live in that circuit that opens all their movies, but there's some amazingly big stars in this movie from Europe. And uh, most of them didn't speak English, but I'd teach them by having an English teacher who would teach the text. And then we would talk about the subtext and it was great. I learned by going to China and teaching a bunch of Chinese students how to act in English <laughs> and they weren't speaking English. So they did the scenes in English and I learned a lot about that because I, I was a singer. So I sang songs in foreign <clears throat> languages but I didn't speak them. Beautiful. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Because we've gone a little bit over our time and I don't, oh. <laughs> well, I, I'm concerned, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah, no, it's, it's good, but it's been fun and very, it's always interesting because to me, it was, I was locked up in a little room, remember, for four years with this film. So it's great to talk to people. <laughs> well, we, we loved it. And, you know, your brother mentioned that we all sat and watched the credits but it was more than that. It was, you could have heard a pin drop as That's we all great. sat in the dark room watching these names because we were absorbing the film, we were watching the names and it was a really a, a testament to how moving and engaging and beautiful the movie was. So I, we really appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Well, yeah. and it's, when you read those credits, what's incredible is how many countries the people mm -hmm. came from. Oh, and, and then how many of my students, because we have a lot of foreign students in grad school, and there were a, a couple of Koreans who their grandfather was in the war. So how did that happen? <laughs> so one guy's grandfather went into, he was in a Korean army and he was, they were captured by the Japanese. And then the Japanese had them in a camp or something and they were taken over by the Russians. So the Russians put these Koreans in their army and this guy ended up in Berlin at the end of the war. Really? And he was watching Warsaw. Uh, yeah, his whole troop. And they were watching Warsaw during that whole time when the, they were trying to let everybody kill each other off. And, mm -hmm. um, what, and an American said, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> you guys speaking Korean. <laughs> but, <laughs> when you think about it really was a world war, it didn't matter where you were from and people were sent to Timbuktu. Yeah. So it was incredible, this war. Mm. I hope- well, Thank you God again, we... thank you so much. Um, and it's very nice to meet you and your brother, Rob, because yes. we know CJ, but we didn't know. Are there more of you? Yes. Yes, how many, <laughs> how many altogether? Well, there's my sister, Lu yeah. Lucy, and then mm -hmm. um, basically that's, David. oh, and David, my other brother, David. So yeah. we have another brother and another sister, and then they have children. So, yeah. uh, but it isn't a huge family with the children. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. not. It's manageable. <laughs> manageable, yes. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, thanks everybody for tuning in. and. Um, Thank you. Well, we'll, thank you. Maybe thank we'll you. see you in New Haven one day. Who knows? Well, yes, I do go. I, can, I do. I do. So <laughs> great. Be great. Sometime, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. You're well, very welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.